Herzlich willkommen zu deinem Lieblingspodcast, dem Bewohnerfrei-Podcast. Dem Podcast, der sich spannende Menschen anschaut und sich dann genau überlegt, wie die dorthin gekommen sind. Und heute ist es mir eine richtig große Ehre, einen Mann zu interviewen, von dem viele wahrscheinlich schon gehört haben. Er ist nämlich in seiner Branche, wenn man das Branche überhaupt nennen kann, ein richtiger Weltstar. Und hier kommt erstmal die offizielle Anmoderation. Gesche Michael Roach absolvierte die Princeton Universität mit Auszeichnung. Danach studierte er über 25 Jahre die alten Schriften an der renommierten indischen Klosteruniversität Sarah May. Und er ist der erste US-Amerikaner mit dem Abschluss Gesche. Das bedeutet Meister des Buddhismus. I just translated that you are a master in Buddhism. Ähm, er hat bei, der, bei der Gründung und dem Aufbau von Andin International, einem der schnellst wachsenden Unternehmen in New York, das mit einem Umsatz von 250 Millionen Dollar von Warren Buffett gekauft wurde. Oh mein Gott. Er hat mehr als 20 Bücher geschrieben und äh, sein Bestseller ist der Diamantenschneider. Und darüber sprechen wir auch mit ihm. Und das wurde in 25 Sprachen übersetzt. Seine Seminare begeistern jährlich 25.000 Menschen. I could continue and go on and go on. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for being in our podcast. Yeah, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very grateful and I've heard about your podcast and it's very cool and very famous and it's a big honor to be on your podcast. Thank you, thank you so much. If there are people who don't know who you are, let's just imagine you are at a barbecue party at a friend and somebody sees <laughs> you there. <laughs> they have a normal job. They don't even, they probably heard Buddhism exists, but they don't really know it. And they ask you, hey, what are you doing? What, how do you respond? Yeah, I fly a lot on airplanes and uh, people next to me always ask me what I do. And uh, it's a really difficult question to answer. There's almost no uh, answer that takes less than half an hour. Uh, but basically, I, I trained in a Buddhist monastery, as you said, for 25 years. And then uh, my teacher challenged me to apply uh, these rules, these laws of karma and mental seeds to start a business in New York. And I, I really didn't want to. And, uh, but I, I did what he asked me to. And then uh, it grew very fast uh, to, to quote a billion dollars. And then uh, I wrote a book about it. And that's how I got into training people because people read the book. Uh, I think it's in 30 languages now. And every year I speak to about 30,000 people uh, live uh, around the world in about 20 countries. So when people ask me what I do, I just say uh, management training, you know, so to avoid all the questions. Wow. Um, I have two little children. They are two and five, three and five. She just turned three. Wow. If, wow. if they ask what Buddhism is, how would you explain it to them? Uh, you know, since I studied Buddhism first at Princeton in a, in a classroom, and uh, my idea of what Buddhism is has changed a lot since then. And uh, I think because my teacher forced me uh, to go and start a business, my opinion of what is Buddhism has changed uh, very radically to include a way of life or, or some ideas for living your life that everybody can use. And I, I speak a lot. I just came back from Indonesia and we spoke to a thousand Muslim people there. Uh, we were in Dubai earlier speaking to uh, some of the royal family and, and other Muslim people there. We, We just spoke in the Congress of Mexico. Uh, everyone's uh, very Catholic. Right. There's, uh, we have about 50 groups in Israel. Uh, we're, it's all in Jewish people. And, and I feel like now, I feel that there's a religion of Buddhism, uh, which if your parents were Buddhist, then you follow that. And then there's the ideas of Buddhism uh, that all of us can use. And so I'm sort of more into that nowadays. I, I, I feel less of a Buddhist than just helping people be successful in their life and be happy in their life by using these ideas. And oftentimes we're in countries where we're not allowed to mention Buddhism and, uh, right. and right. we just talk about the ideas. If, and if you break it down, what does it, to me, what does it mean to you being You're not, I mean, you're not, a, you're a Buddhist, but you're also a teacher, a geisha of Buddhism. What does it mean to you? Uh, you know, we're in a small college that we built uh, several years ago, and we train 
speakers here uh, all over the, from all over the world. And upstairs, we have a department where uh, we sit for five or six hours at a time and we translate ancient literature. Sometimes it's 2,000 years old, two and a half thousand years old. And we work very, very hard for 31 years. Uh, we have gone around the world to save ancient Asian literature and digitalize it. So we've been doing that for over 30 years. We have a huge database of several million pages and uh, we have a great search program. So upstairs at this building, uh, we have a 20 people team uh, just translating the ancient wisdom. And I feel like it's snow on the Himalaya mountains coming down on the mountains. And then that trickles downstairs in this college to where we train people to go all over the world and teach people the great ideas. So that's a constant evolution. It hasn't, it never stops, it never slows down. For example, when we come to Germany in November, uh, 3rd and 4th of November, uh, we'll be uh, opening a new level of our training, uh, which is a, called Impossible Anger. And it's about how you can be a business person or how you can be a family person and overcome permanently uh, ever getting upset or ever getting angry at somebody. And that's a new uh, training that has melted down from the Himalaya snows upstairs here where people are translating ancient books. Right. So, so I already hear it's very difficult to narrow it down what it really means because it's thousands of books and there's so much, so much literature. Mm -hmm. In Germany especially, many people mix Buddhism with spirituality or mm -hmm. they are, they are, they're using like Buddhism literature and then mm -hmm. that usually doesn't connect to business. And what I love with your... Mm -hmm. What, what you did is that you have connected both worlds. Was that difficult for you? Uh, in the beginning, it was pretty strange. You know, my, my teacher, as I said, uh, I was in the monastery for eight years as a monk. And uh, one day he called me and said, you have to go start a business in New York. And I, you know, you know to that monastery, you can't say no to your teacher. It's, it's against all the rules. It's the first rule. But I delayed and delayed and delayed. Uh, and then finally he said, you have to go. And uh, I honestly didn't understand why he was asking me to leave and start a business. And I felt very uncomfortable uh, to go. And I remember uh, reaching New York with $7 and no business suit. Uh, I, I, was, <laughs> I had no resting clothes. And uh, I went to a special store where they sell the clothes of dead people. And I got a suit for five dollars, and uh, I started a business. We started our business with three diamonds, and uh, he wanted to force me to try to see that these ideas can help everybody uh, in everything they do. And uh, and I, I also had a problem with, uh, you know, business often means money, and and business revolves around money. And uh, I like the monk's way of life. I, I don't like uh, try owning many things. I, I find it an obstacle in my life. But he kind of forced me to learn that uh, there's a way to, to live with, with a family, to have two beautiful small children, and uh, to be a famous podcast uh, host, <laughs> and uh, you know, to make a good income, and still be a spiritual person. And uh, right. it was a big breakthrough for me and, and I think people all over the world really they resonate with this idea that you can be very successful and you can at the same time be spirit, spiritual. I remember asking people "Are you? do you meditate and they would say no I'm a businessman and then I'd say well why can't a business person uh, meditate and then uh, right. it became I, I think the world has changed since I first wrote that book not just because of me but uh, I think there's a beautiful change in the world where business people are, are doing meditation. I, I put yoga in the book in 1999 and they asked me to take it out uh, because <laughs> nobody was doing yoga. And, uh, and now okay. things have changed and it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful world and people like you are, are spreading it. Mm. When, I, I just imagine when you're, um, how are they called in the monastery? Your master, your teacher? Um, when he approached you, yeah. 
Um, how did you Thank handle? You okay. How did you handle your ego? Because you said that was it wasn't even in your plan. How, how did you handle what you want and put it together with what was meant to be for you? How did how did you handle that? Because I do believe many people struggle with that a lot. I think if you, I think in in our tradition, the tradition is tradition is to try to find a real master, and uh, there's stories of people examining a master for 12 years before they commit to the master. So uh, in this tradition, uh, you're required to question and to investigate and really, you know, detective work to find out if this is a person has integrity and if they're honest and if they know what they're talking about. And that process traditionally might take uh, four or five years. You go to their classes, talk to their students, see if there's any problems with them. And then uh, you make a commitment. And then after you make a commitment, uh, they have the right to ask you to do strange things like go to New York and start a business. And, right. and uh, if you trust them. Uh, and uh, like I didn't know why he wanted me to do that. And I, I really felt uncomfortable with it. But because of this ancient code that you you follow your teacher's wishes. I, I went and I, I, I honestly felt very uncomfortable. And, uh, but now I'm so happy and maybe it took 10 years later for me to realize what he was trying to do. Yeah. Right. What interested me a lot is when did you get your calling to go into Buddhism at the first place? Because I imagine, I, I read your biography, you grew up as a normal child and, and there was preschool and, and how, how was your childhood? How were, how were you framed for beliefs and when did the switch come and how? Yeah, I was uh, very active uh, in the Christian church. Uh, my mom was very uh, active in the church. And as a child, I, I sang in the church for, I think, 12 years. And I was an altar boy uh, in a very, very wonderful church in my hometown in Arizona. And uh, we had great priests there. And it was a very uh, beautiful place. And then I went to Princeton. And uh, in my last, in my third year at Princeton, Uh, my mom got breast cancer, and she was dying. And uh, I had suddenly this breakthrough moment where I realized uh, there wasn't anything in the university that could really help me uh, understand what was happening to my mom. And someone invited me to India uh, to meet the Buddhist masters, you know. And uh, I just, on a whim, uh, I, I got on the plane and I went to meet them. And uh, so I intended first, to stay for a few months. So the, yeah. The, the first initial then, was pain. You left because of you didn't know yeah. where, where to go and what happened. Yeah, in Buddhism, there's a spiritual path, evolution through five stages. Uh, they say all spiritual seekers go through five stages. And the first stage is, frankly, it's called personal disaster. <laughs> So uh, you need something to shake you up and to wake you up to the fact that we're all, uh, we're all in the same boat. Everybody in the world, whatever religion you are, whatever country you're from, uh, we still have the same trouble. We have the same pain. We all live in a body which gets sick. Uh, we, we lose family members. Uh, we lose our, our work fails sometimes. And, and this kind of uh, disaster, uh, we all share Uh, in our life. If you live long enough, uh, you will see all of these things in your own life. And then that pushes you to try to do something. And then if you're lucky, uh, a higher motivation kicks in where you would like to do something to help the whole world avoid this kind of trouble. Yeah. Right. So then you flew there, you met the Indian masters How did, you, how did you bring your thoughts together of what you have learned in Christianity and your childhood and what is being taught there? Were you open right away or was it more a, this is all new situation? Uh, it was definitely really new and kind of frightening and, and uh, a lot of the outward rituals. Like I, in Princeton, I was active in the church. I was even signed up to go to seminary to become a minister myself. And uh, I was supposed to go uh, within a few months. And uh, 
I, you know, I was enjoying this. Princeton has a beautiful cathedral, like, like some of your cathedrals in Germany. We copied your cathedrals. And uh, we had uh, beautiful music, organ music. And then suddenly I'm in this temple with all bright colors and people are going, you know, and banging on things. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, I they, thought, they, oh, they, I'm they, you know, I thought, oh, I must have made a big mistake. Uh, but I think you have to get beyond the outer rituals and uh, go to the ideas. So the ideas are very warm and very welcoming. And the thoughts of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus uh, in the New Testament, they are very, very similar to, to what Buddha taught. They're, they are almost exactly the same. So I've actually still enjoy going to church. I still go to church maybe once a month, uh, the same church that I grew up in. And uh, I really, really wow. enjoy it. And I feel like I understand Jesus is teaching better than before. Do you remember your first meditation when you meditated? <laughs> or, or, yeah, the first meditation. And where is the difference between meditating and praying in your words? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, I did. Uh, I do remember the first meditation, and it was very funny. My uh, my lama took me to a very small room, and said, "This is going to be your room, just temporarily. Uh, we don't have other rooms in the monastery right now, and you're new, and you're going to stay here." And I could touch the walls with my hands, and uh, and the bed was Tibetan size, which is about uh, half a meter shorter than me. Wow. And I had to curl up wow. on the bed. And, uh, and then he said, you meditate. Do you know how to meditate? And I was very arrogant, Princeton boy. And I said, yes, I, I read a book. I understand everything. And he said, okay, you meditate on emptiness. And then you come, when you hear the bell ring, he had a bell that he used to ring to call me. And uh, he lived upstairs. He said, when you hear the bell ring, you run upstairs and I'll check, and I'll check your meditation. So I was meditating and I read a book that emptiness means uh, you should close your eyes and everything's black and, uh, you know, you will go into the void. And I was meditating and I heard the bell ring and I ran upstairs and he asked me, what, how was your meditation? I said, well, I meditated on the void, on nothing. And then he said, Koopa. And I said, what's Koopa? He said, stupid. That's stupid. He said, go back and try again. This happened three times. Second time. I closed my eyes. I tried to think about nothing because I heard in a meditation book, you're supposed to think about nothing. And uh, then he rang his bell. I went upstairs. He said, uh, this is my first meditation. He said, did you meditate on emptiness? I said, yeah, I, I try to think about nothing, just the flaw, thoughts going through my mind. And uh, then he said, uh, Shinto Kupa, which means very stupid. <laughs> and uh, then uh, he said, go back and try again. Then I, I heard this uh, meditation that there's no good, there's no bad, there's no happy, there's no sad. Try to be neutral. Try not to feel good. Try not to feel bad. Just be neutral and stare at the wall, you know. And wow. then he rang his bell. Well, then he said, Shintinine Kupa. He said, that's a super stupid idea. Uh, this is not emptiness. And uh, so I asked him, what is can you tell me what is emptiness in a way that I can use it for the rest of my life? Yeah, on the first day, can you tell me what is emptiness? And do you mind, Tobias, five minutes? Yes, I would love to okay. know. Okay, well, he, he got a pen and he, uh, he held it in front of me and he said, I'm going to ask you questions and I want you to answer just honestly how you feel and uh, you're going to learn emptiness on the first day here uh and i said oh yeah I, I would love to and he held up the pen and he said what's this and i said oh that's a pen you know and then he said uh if a small dog came in this room and grab it you know how do they see this pen and i said well they they think it's a something to chew you know and then he said uh does the dog see a pen and I, when they look at this thing. And I said, no, I think they see uh, something to chew. And then he said, well, who's right? Who's correct? 
Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I don't know why he's talking about a pen. He's supposed to be talking about emptiness. And I said, uh, both, both are correct. The dog can enjoy and a human can write with it. And uh, it's a both at the same time. Mm-hmm. Then he said, if I leave the pen on the chair and I leave the room and you leave the room and, there's, and the dog leaves the room and there's nothing in the room anymore, uh, the pen is on the table, this thing is on the table, uh, then at that time, is it a pen or is it something to chew? And then I was a little confused and I, I said, well, I think it's kind of nothing. At that time, it's, it's kind of nothing. Until somebody comes in, it's just a thing on the table. And he said, very good. He said, that's emptiness. Wow. He said, Don't f-. He said that's emptiness. Then he said, if the human comes back in the room uh, and looks at this thing, uh, what does it become? And I said, well, I guess it becomes a pen in that moment that the human looks at it, it becomes a pen. And then he said, uh, yeah. And it, it wasn't a pen five minutes before. And then it became a pen. So then he asked me, uh, so I, I have to ask you a question. Is the pen coming from you? Or is the pen coming from the pen? You know? And I was thinking about it and I said, well, if the pen comes from itself this way, then the dog will see a pen. So I guess it's coming from me. And then the chewing toy is coming from the dog. And he said, right. that's perfect. So out of emptiness comes uh, things. And then he said, why do you think uh, things, why do you think you see a pen? And then he explained to me that we have seeds in our mind. And the name of those seeds in, in Sanskrit is karma. And uh, by, for example, if, I, if Tobias needs a pen, and if I give up my pen and I give it to Tobias as my friend, then uh, when I let go of the pen, uh, I create a karma. I create a seed in my mind because I see my hand open. I see wow. the hand open. That's recorded in my mind. And that puts a seed. After a few days, that becomes a seed in my mind. And then uh, later when I walk in the room and I look at this thing on the table, then that seed cracks open in my mind. And a small picture of a pen comes out of my mind very, very fast, 65 per second. And uh, I see a pen. So then when I started a business, uh, he said, don't, re- don't forget the first day in the monastery when I taught you the pen. He said, try to make a business with your seeds. You know? Try to make wow. a business this way. And, uh, and then the rest- Yeah, it's cool. And, and, yeah, and for the first time, I have a positive understanding of karma, how you explained it right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a negative karma when you hurt someone. Like if I lie in my, let's say I don't pay taxes in my business, mm-hmm. then actually I'm hurting all the people in Germany. If, if mm-hmm. you know, I'm not mm-hmm. paying my share, so someone else has to pay my share, then I'm hurting, I don't know, 80 million people or something. I'm hurting the whole population of Germany. Uh, but if I, if I pay a little extra tax on purpose... <laughs> then the government is very kindly helping me to make karma by distributing <laughs> that money to in, every in, German. In Germany, they would send it back. They, they would, they, we are so precise, they would send it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, if I purposely help my friends in their business. I, I say once a week, one hour for free, uh, help your friends to start their own business or right. help your friends with something they need in their business, then your business will grow because those seeds multiply in the mind. They say every 24 hours, uh, the seed doubles in power. Wow. Uh, this is an ancient teaching. So if you do it with understanding, then uh, you can make a $250 million. We doubled every year for 18, uh, every 18 months. Uh, for 19 years, we doubled the company uh, every 18 months, exactly every 18 months. 
And it was one of the fastest growing companies in the history of New York. And, and I think it all came from that pen. <laughs> it, it's all because of the pen. You mentioned something very, very interesting when we started the conversation. You said um, that at the moment there's something happening in the world that uh, more people are getting more interested in these topics. Um, like, for mm -hmm. example, next year um, I will be hosting a spiritual business summit in Germany because that is something that doesn't exist. It's like the combination of business And, and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And why do you think there is this big need that that is happening right now? Because also the event that you are hosting in Germany in November, it will be full. I mean, there will be probably a couple of hundreds coming out of this meeting now, mm -hmm. but why are people mm -hmm. getting more and more interested in that? Is that also karma? <laughs> uh, it is karma, but I think it's a, a good karma of all of us. I think... Uh, so for about 50,000 years, uh, and Buddhism would say because of some natural defect in the mind, uh, we have felt that competition is the way to get more success. And I think America is very guilty. American business, American philosophy of capitalism is very much a part of this thinking that uh, Coca-Cola must fight with Pepsi Cola or Volkswagen must fight with Chevrolet or, you know, there must be this competition and then whoever is stronger, uh, whoever has better marketing, uh, they will win. And uh, the goal of business is to fight for a bigger share of a certain market. And, and that idea of competition is actually based on not understanding the pen. Right. So, uh, If the pen comes from seeds in my mind, which I planted there by helping Tobias uh, <laughs> with his business, then uh, it's, in theory, uh, the economy should grow uh, okay. without, without stopping, without slowing down. And the only way for me to get more pens is to share more with Tobias. Uh, to do more cooperation, to help you be successful. Right. And uh, so the model, I think when we go around the world and, and we teach in many, many countries and it's growing like mushrooms. We even have trouble with, uh, you know, things are going too fast. And uh, <laughs> people are so relieved to, be, to hear that the way to success is to help Uh, the people around you and to support them rather than uh, competing with them. Right. And, then, and then business naturally becomes spiritual because helping other people is the goal of the spiritual life. So if, you, if the only way you can make more money is to help Tobias to make more money, then automatically the world becomes spiritual without announcing it. Nobody right. nobody but we all got spiritual wow how, um, how do you um, what do you think like to everyday problems the world has right now let's take the pollution of the seas like the, my company mm -hmm. we try to help uh, take the plastic out of the ocean how, how what is your approach to these things because you said it there's a lot of not good things coca-cola against pepsi and there's also the pollution of our planet, which has pretty much never been that bad. How, how can we unite people to solve that? Or is that also, if we all meditate, it would help? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I grew up surfing, and I really enjoy surfing. Uh, I'm 65, I still go surfing. And uh, so the ocean is very dear to me. Uh, and I was invited to Bali Uh, last month uh, by some Indonesian friends to give some talks there uh, about business. And uh, I was looking forward to it because uh, Bali has good surf. And when I got there, I was very disappointed. Uh, just you get into the ocean there and there are plastic bags floating, not on the surface, they float about uh, half a meter under the surface. And you feel like you're you're in a bunch of jellyfish or something and you get scared and then you realize it's somebody's plastic bags. And I actually felt very sad and very depressed. I didn't have a good time surfing there. And uh, it was 
it was kind of uh, really sad. And uh, I thought, well, what can I do about it? And uh, when I was in college, it was during the Vietnam War, and uh, I actually went to jail briefly uh, as protesting against the war. So I thought, uh, you know, in those days I was thinking, we have to stand up, uh, we have to make our voice heard, uh, and the way is to go to Washington. Uh, we took over the entrance to the White House, and, you know, we should do things like this. And uh, I still believe it was a very uh, good thing and a very right thing to do, to, to stand up right. and say, I, I right. don't want these plastic bags. I, I can live with, with cloth bag and I can bring my cloth bag to the store. Uh, but in this system, if the pen thing is correct, then not only my company, but my environment, uh, New York City, uh, is coming partly from my own seeds, you see, from what I do personally. Uh, if, if it's true the pen is coming out of seeds in my mind, then New York City's traffic, New York City's pollution, and plastic bags in the ocean in Bali, uh, in some way, I'm responsible. And uh, in some way, if I change those uh, seeds in my own mind, that will improve. I can improve those things. So it's good to take political action. I still believe that and I still do it. Uh, we're, we're very active in, in different uh, refugee causes, for example. But uh, at the same time, uh, I sh if I'm more careful not to pollute my environment, my immediate environment, if I don't throw garbage or I pick up garbage on the street and I take a moment, apparently when you plant a karma in your mind, intention or how much joy you take, how much pleasure you take is very extremely important. Right. So if I pick up a piece of garbage in Berlin uh, off the street and I say, I'm doing this for the plastic bags in Bali. In Bali you know? okay. And uh, apparently that seed and that intention is, is extremely powerful. And in addition to designing ships that can pick up plastic bags out of the ocean, which I'm very happy has just come, just right. the first ship is out. From Holland, right? Yeah. From the I Netherlands. think so. And then... Yeah. Yeah, and one young man did it. One young yeah. man's dream. And, oh, yeah, Slut, he, uh, was yeah. A, he was a space engineer, and he said, instead of going to other planets, we have work, work to do here. That's how yeah, it's I think it's so good. So uh, in addition to supporting those guys financially, for example, uh, which is another reason to be successful in business, now I have enough money to support uh, things like those ships or things like that. But at the wow. same time, even while I'm making, you know, millions of dollars and, and donating them to, to help these guys, mm -hmm. at the same moment, uh, karma, I must uh, stoop down and pick up the garbage I see on the street. And uh, in my intentions, I have to send it to the ocean. Yeah. Right. Before we talk about uh, the diamond cutter, because that is very, very uh, interesting, I would like to know how did you handle your anger at the moment when you were in Bali? Because you are also a human being, right? And you, you went to Bali, yeah, yeah. you had expectations for a nice surf, and it just didn't happen. How do you handle that? <laughs> that's actually, as, as you know, that's why uh, we're, what we're going to present in Berlin on uh, November 3rd and 4th. Uh, at the uh, Hotel Bristol. Yeah. And uh, Beautiful it's a new hotel, training. Way, uh, I know it. <laughs> oh, I'm happy. It's, uh, yeah, how to deal with anger. And, and it's very, very interesting. And we like to do a skit. We like to do a little play on the stage when we teach it. And it's about a working woman. And she works for an international company. Uh, and she is in a rush in the morning with her kids. She has two children, just like my friend. And uh, she's supposed to uh, get the kids ready for school, but they're not ready to go. And then she yells at them and she says, uh, you know, you kids are stupid. You are the worst kids in Berlin. And then uh, how karma is planted is uh, when she talks, 
uh, she hears her own words in her own ear. Mm. And that creates an impression on her mind, on her brain. And then after a few hours, that becomes a karmic seed in the subconscious. Wow. And then that seed starts growing. That seed starts having babies. And uh, so then we say a week what later. You say and do, it's also what you think. Yeah, uh, three things. Uh, your mind records everything you do. I did a three year retreat in the monastery. I did a thousand days of silence. And, uh, and I realized. Uh, I, I'm afraid to do 10. Yeah. I'm thinking about doing the, yeah, yeah. the 10 day. <laughs> I, I'm already freaking out. Uh, Oh, uh, no, you'll really enjoy it. And it's good for business people. We teach business people. Well, I'm going tomorrow on a, to teach business people a 14-day retreat with no talking and a 10-day retreat. And uh, so anyway, when I was silent for a thousand days, I, I realized everything I ever saw in my life is recorded in my mind. Everything I heard, everything I saw. And as you say, Tobias, everything I ever thought has been recorded. And my mind is like a big hard drive. And uh, when you're silent for, for three years, uh, you can play back movies and stuff. You can watch movies in your meditation hut. And <laughs> so, uh, oh my God, I don't even know anyway, what I would see then. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, uh, or sorry, the next week, the lady comes home and she opens the door to the kitchen and she didn't say anything. And her husband yells at her and says, you're stupid, you know? And, uh, and at that moment, uh, we get angry. We feel angry. And, it, and we might say, no, I'm not stupid. You're stupid. And then she will feel very hurt. And she will say, I didn't do anything. I just walked in the kitchen. And before I said anything, my husband called me stupid, you know? So in this pen theory, uh, she planted seeds last week. When she heard herself say, the kids are stupid. And now this week, when she opens the kitchen door, the seed opens. Right. It sends out a picture of her husband. Right. And her husband is screaming at her. And if right. she's been trained at the Bristol Hotel in Berlin on November 3rd and 4th, <laughs> if she went to those all-day trainings, then maybe she will remember. Oh, right. He's yelled at me because I yelled at my kids, you know. Wow. And she, will, she will calm down, you know, uh, and, and she will understand and she will make a breakthrough of her life in that moment. She will wow. realize that if she says, no, you're stupid, if she responds again, then she'll plant another seed. And next week, the kids will be bad again, you see. And, I understand. And then that, I, I'm in I'm in trouble. I think too much. I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in trouble. What what do but what do I do when the thought comes? <laughs> oh well, you can uh, that you know if you're if the thought comes to yell at the kids or something, and you use this pen, if this is like a sword against your mind, hmm. you know you are hmm. sword fighting with your mind, and you say wait we shouldn't say bad things to our children because then the husband will say bad things to me next week, you know? And we say that the understanding cuts the anger. Right. So uh, it doesn't mean the kids weren't bad. The kids were bad. It doesn't mean the husband didn't call you stupid. He did call you stupid. But the, mo the way you can prove that the husband is correct is to answer. Wow. Then you really are stupid. That is, that's it's very, very funny. Very, that is very, very yeah. inspiring. Because I, I do so yeah. many podcast interviews, but this time I'm like, ah, okay. Okay, yeah, now I, as can... I'm in my thoughts, let, let's come to the diamond cutting because we have very, one very big similarity. I just published a book and a big part of the book is about that we are unpolished diamonds. And you call the program... Wow, that's... Yeah, isn't that interesting? And, and you call it diamond cutting what what's the story behind that because mine is like that, that diamonds are being polished all their life because that's because they're so beautiful it's not because they're just laying around <laughs> oh that's a beautiful idea for a book it's in the title 
Um, yeah, no, it, uh, the title is it's called um, Unbox Your Life. It's about unboxing what you have instead of just like settling for something you are you're believed to be in the past. That's but it has one picture oh. in it where where it says that um, the, the diamond is the symbol of uh, because it was coal once and it was a tree once and now it's a diamond because there was pressure and it, something happened yeah. to it. That's the, the picture. I'm looking for the picture. Mm -hmm. What's your definition of diamond cutting? Uh, I'm, I'm very excited it's in your book because it means you have some kind of instinct here, upon it. But, it uh, you see that? Oh, yeah, yeah. And pressure makes it. Uh, right. Pressure makes it happen. <laughs> That's a great idea. That's a really nice idea. I'd like to get the book, by the way. <laughs> okay, it's I'll called send it to you. What's it called? Unbox the. Uh, Unbox your life. I'm going to send you a copy. <laughs> okay, I need one. Uh, so, when I went to start the business, I was assigned by my Lama, who was the boss of the monastery. It's one of the three largest monasteries in the world. So, he was a tough guy. And uh, we lived together for 25 years. And uh, he sent me to New York and he said, you know, start a business. And I said, I have no idea. I don't know what business to do. I have no training. I have no interest. And I'm afraid that if I hang out with those other business guys, they will corrupt me. You know, I will become dishonest. And, and then he said, uh, I said, do you have some kind of plan? Do you, have, do you have some kind of plan you want me to follow? And he uh, gave me an ancient book. It's by the Buddha. It was written two and a half thousand years ago. Wow. It was a lecture but in a place uh, in India called Shravasti. And uh, in, it's called The Diamond Cutter. The book is called The Diamond Cutter. And uh, in that book, uh, he compares uh, emptiness, the emptiness of the pen. He compares it to a diamond. And as you said, uh, an uncut diamond, a rough diamond. And so my teacher said, he handed me the book. And he uh, said, read this. It's about 40 pages. And then uh, he said, read this and use it as your business plan. <laughs> so uh, I opened the book. So j just to and I read the, in a nutshell, you used yeah. the 2,500-year-old book as your business plan to build one of the biggest companies New York has ever seen. Yeah. And it's, it was crazy. I opened up the book. I read the first sentence. And the <laughs> Buddha is... Uh, having a conversation with his student. And uh, the Buddha says, uh, is a mountain big? And the student says, yes, a mountain is big. And the Buddha says, why is a mountain big? And the student says, because it's not big. And I'm like looking at the book and I'm looking at my teacher and I, he often frustrated me. I guess that's what their job is. Mm. And, and I was like, I don't understand anything i don't see how i can use this in a business and he said you figure it out that he used to always tell me that you know you figure it out and he threw the book at me and he, he said you figure it out uh so it was it was kind of like uh you see the pen is not what we thought uh that in that sense the pen is gone there's no husband or wife in the kitchen who's yelling at you for no reason at all. That kind of husband, that kind of wife, who's not coming from you, from how you treated the kids last week, a husband or wife in the kitchen, who's not come from your seats, is, doesn't exist. There's no such thing. So that's what it means when you say the mountain uh, doesn't exist, you see? All the things in the world uh, like our, our, our husband or our wife, that, that, that we have challenges with them, to live with them, to, right. to be at peace with them, love them. Right. Uh, all right. those things don't exist. So when you're angry at someone, you're actually angry at something which you planted last week. So if you're going to be angry, you should go in the toilet and look in the mirror and you should yell at the person as, who as, caused this why <laughs> you should know that yourself yeah. and uh you know if you hear all the detail of that idea it's it's very beautiful because if you have a 
marriage, and if you have children, uh, then that's more than 50% of your life, you know. Uh, it has to go smooth. If Definitely. that's not going smooth, when, when you get to your business, if you're an angry person, uh, if you get upset easily, then uh, you will fail in business. Right. Uh, you have to be cool. If, if we take the analogy of the diamond, because you just said that your, your master, he took the book, kind of threw it at you, being, <laughs> being polished by other people like who, met, who do it with love, um, is, is yeah. that how we grow? Is that, is that, was that good for you at this time? Or would you have wished somebody who, tell, who says, oh, come sit next to me, I tell you everything. Was that a good part <laughs> that he, he let you figure out instead of just telling you how it works? Because I, I, I think he, here's, here's why I asked the question. I see an entire generation of young people that have, they have the internet, they have, they have all the knowledge in the world, but sometimes I have the feeling they are not willing to be really polished before they do something. So looking back to your yeah. career, how important was that? I think, uh, you know, I was sitting with some friends yesterday and, uh, we were talking about gratitude and uh, somebody asked me, did your teacher show gratitude to you? You know, I, I was his uh, driver. I was his, I was the cook for eight years. I washed dishes for eight years in the monastery. And uh, you know, he, he forced me to do service, you know, and not theoretical service. <laughs> he, he forced me to scrub toilets and, and water his plants. And, you know, he, He forced me uh, to do a lot of things that I didn't want to do. And I cannot recall that he ever thanked me once in 19 years. Uh, and, and people were like, well, didn't he have any gratitude? You know, didn't he uh, ever give you emotional support? And I think, as you say, Tobias, uh, uh, Buddhism rep rep We, we, we see different kinds of personality types. You know, some students are naturally loving. Uh, some pe people are naturally selfish. Some students are naturally very proud. And I think I'm in that category still. I haven't advanced that much. Uh, but uh, where he was trying to break me like a horse, the Tibetan word for disciple is horse to be broken. You know, and... Uh, He, uh, I think he, you know, he saw that the thing that would give me the most trouble in my life is pride. Wow. And he made it his job to, to break it. And uh, I, so I think it takes great wisdom and trust between a teacher and a student. And when I think of him, I still cry. And uh, he died uh, about 15 years ago. Wow. And uh, I think he really, really loved me enough to we call it tough love in in america <laughs> he gave love. me a lot of uh, tough love you know and right. yeah i think uh i'm not very good at giving that to people i i want people to like me but i think as a parent for example uh you must feel that there's times when you have to be tough with your children uh like if they're trying to cross the street on a busy street a friend of mine's child just died Uh, in a street. They just stepped out on the street and they got killed uh, a few months ago. And uh, he, now he's wishing he had shown the child tough love uh, when the child you know, doesn't hold his hand when he's crossing the street. And uh, I, think, I think, yeah, if you're a very wise teacher, uh, yeah. you can tough love. Yeah. I have so many light bulbs going up because, first of all, I have to be very honest to you. I started meditating only half a year ago. And before half a year mm -hmm. ago, I wasn't ready for it. I thought business people don't do that, exactly what you said. And I opened my, yeah. my channel to that world. And three days ago, I went to a, um, a friend's house and they are Baha'i, you know, the Baha'i religion. And... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They read out of a paper and it said exactly the same thing. It said that Dienstbarkeit, which is a German word for being, for doing service to others, is the highest mm -hmm. thing you can do because that is, that is almost like praying. Even if you clean dishes, or, but if you do it full heart, then it really works. Yeah. So you're connecting like a, a million dots in my mind right now. I'm, 
Okay, mm. but uh, one last question. Um, how important are the people in our surrounding for us and for our success? Because one of my beliefs I have is that if I spend time with the wrong people, so to say, who are always telling me how things are not going to work and are like, like weights on my shoulders, it's going to be very difficult for me. How do you, what do you think about the concept and how do you handle it? Uh, you know, a few days ago, we finished a, a two-week training here in our small college in Arizona, and it was about uh, addiction, about alcohol addiction, for example. And one of the modules of that training is to talk about the addictive environment. Uh, so it involves your friends, uh, your family, uh, the, the, the alcohol laws in the country where you live, uh, the social customs around alcohol in the country where you live. And we spent a whole uh, hour and a half talking about uh, the environment of alcoholism. You know, if, I'm, if I have a trouble with alcohol, then if I have a bad environment around me, if I have liquor stores everywhere, if it's a custom for people to drink at dinner or, or before dinner, uh, if my friends are drinking, uh, if my family's drinking, then it's going to be almost impossible for me to stop drinking. Right. And we discussed uh, the idea of avoidance. You know, should I try very hard to inv avoid my environment? Should I not be with my friends? Or should I avoid my family? <laughs> should I not drive my car because the liquor stores are... In America, you drive into the liquor store. Right. And what we said was, remember the pen. Remember the pen. <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> uh, this environment... You created your friends, and you created your family. Uh, so the answer is, if your environment is not what you want, and if your environment is kind of what we call bad friends, right, they're coming from you. So if you make an effort to help other people stop their addictions, like in America, we all have addiction to eating too much. 65% of Americans are overweight. I like to go to Germany. They're so, they look so cool. And, uh, <laughs> not, so our, not all of them. <laughs> well, a lot. And uh, so our country has a national problem with uh, eating badly. So if I try to help my friends to eat better, if I give them vegetables, green smoothies, uh, if I support my friends' good eating, then the alcoholics around me, that bad environment will change because wow. they're also coming from from my seats. So actually, politically, internationally, with the environment, you know, the big environment, the green environment, uh, the Amazon, I heard about it yesterday, it's, it's, uh, it's, now, it's now emitting carbon for the first time in history. It's not accepting more carbon. The guy said, look, the Amazon said I had too much. And that's it. That's all I can store of your pollution, you know. And now, uh, this year, for the first time, the largest forest in the world is emitting carbon. And uh, so that's all coming from how I behave to my friends uh, and my family. Do I support uh, them getting over their own addictions to food or things like that? And then the environment will change because I changed my seat. Wow. So in our last minutes, before we talk about the event in Germany really quick, um, could you give me a number between 1 and 77? Because my community sent me some... Uh, questions and I can't answer them. I can't ask them all. So you can pick a number. <laughs> One to seventy-seven. I like sixteen. I like sixteen. Sixteen. All right. Wow. Oh, I mean that's a big one. <laughs> okay. Um, in German, the question is: Was war dein prägendstes Erlebnis? It means in English: What was your What was the incident that changed your life the most? You already said mm. part of it with your mother, probably. Yeah, I think it was my mom's death, and it kind of pushed me to question bigger things. And you ask why, why business people are getting spiritual nowadays. I think it's because we all feel that our death is coming, uh, no matter how successful we are. Uh, I, I believe we should be successful. I believe we should have financial success, personal success, good family, uh, healthy body. But 
there's evidence all around us that people are dying. Good people are dying. And uh, I think uh, when a death comes close to you, it's a blessing that you can start asking spiritual questions. And if you can combine spirituality with your daily career, then I think that's perfect. Yeah. That's beautiful, yeah. So at the end, uh, short questions, short answers. Uh, money is? <laughs> a method to help people. Okay. How do you personally grow? Mm, make mistakes and learn. Okay. The, the, um, the sentence that gave me the most... Uh, I love you, said by my lama, you know, in final, at the final moment, it was done. <laughs> okay, and the last question, um, the most beautiful place I've ever been to? Uh, my own mind, uh, when I'm having a really super clear meditation. Wow, that was very, 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 very inspiring to me. Vielen, vielen Dank, dass ihr zugehört habt. Auch für diese Folge wieder. Ähm, seid so lieb, gibt uns hier eine Bewertung bei iTunes. Für mich war es einer der inspirierendsten Folgen, die ich jemals aufgenommen habe. Ich bin total rot, das kenne ich gar nicht. I'm, I'm really, I got really hot, the energy. I don't know what it is, what, what you gave to me, but uh, it's pretty good. So, and I can already promise you, I will come to one of your seminars. So I'm very, very inspired. I'd love to come to Berlin. That would be very exciting to meet you.